Welcome to The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa, time for Off the Press. As always, we will take you through the pages of our national dailies. Front pages, to be precise, we have Chris Kende Wandu who joins the conversation. I'd like to start off with the Guardian newspaper this morning. Let's look at the big stories on the Guardian newspaper. The board caption says, Fuel scarcity, panic buying in Lagos as NATO threatens strike. Artificial scarcity caused by recall of dirty petrol source claims and NATO to withdraw haulage services over diesel price operation cost. These are uh, the riders underneath the board caption. Federal government received 2 million doses of Johnson & Johnson vaccines from the EU as NCDC confirms 36 new infections. IPUB reaffirms April deadline for ban of goat meat in Southeast. What's going to happen? Probably we'll just eat fish. Some people say meat is not very healthy, but let's see how that pans out. Away from that, airline seek review of 200,000 COVID-19 test protocol per traveler. Uh, that's also what you find. Niger to spend 92% of 2022 revenue on debt servicing international monetary fund projects. As quoted on that, and you also have federal government will bring Igboho back to Nigeria after prosecution in Bene, says Malami. That's the Attorney General of the E-Federation. That's the much we can take on The Guardian this morning. Uh, we'll go straight to the punch newspaper with the following headlines on uh, the front page uh, uh, with the kicker portal breakdown. And the headline, NIMC telcos meet again, Chinese, Nigerians, battle faults. Subscribers remain stranded. The following writers, NIN verification problems affecting other agencies. Downtime enters seventh day. Chinese Indian manufacturers join Galaxy Backbone in marathon repair sessions. And JAM rules out postponement of 2022 UTME registration deadline amidst hitches. And uh, you have pictures of uh, some petrol stations that were closed and some Nigerians uh, queuing uh, to buy petrol, some even with uh, uh, jerry cans. You can see black market operators as well with their hose in hand. Lagos filling station shut as queues persist in Abuja, others. At the top of that front page, GT Co. Uh, completes acquisition of funds management pension firms. Details on page 21. Sanusi denies presidential bid, says Nigeria, sinking deeper in 2023. Reps probe 45 million accounts without BVN uh, with 1.2 trillion naira deposit. What will happen to that money? We're set for indefinite strike. Federal government dribbling us, says Asu. We're set for indefinite strike. Federal government dribbling us says Asu. Still with a punch, Buhari won't sign electoral bill if amended for selfish interests. Malami uh, saying that, and of course, um, he was touted as being the one to give the president uh, the advice on whether to sign that bill or not to sign that bill. Buhari won't sign electoral bill if amended for selfish interest. Another one, remove fuel subsidy official exchange rate, IMF, urges FG. Remove fuel subsidy, official exchange rate, IMF urges FG. And at the bottom of that front page, the following headlines. Oh, platform explosion, two more bodies recovered from wreckage. Really sad. Ondo EMC doctors tackle CMD over retirement and a panel's visit. Oromani defense prosecution or defense prosecution clash over evidence. Father weeps testifies February 14. And Presidency, I want to stop Nigeria from disintegration, says Tambuwao. Widow faces imprisonment for cutting house helps body with razor. Ondo keeps children. And finally, Wiki Makarafi state grounds for PDP's victory in 2023. Let's move away from the punch new super and check out the nation. Petrol panic in Lagos and Abuja. It's a bold caption on the nation newspaper. And NATO threatens strike over costs. No scarcity of products, says NMPC. IMF calls for fiscal reforms and VAT rise subsidy court. 
IMF calls for fiscal reforms that raise subsidy court. That's what you also find on the nation. Forget president. If there's no unity, WK wants the People's Democratic Party. And you have NFF appoints Amunike Eagles chief coach. GTCO acquires investment one pension managers. And uh, just before we move away from the nation newspaper, a position on Igboho, Kanu, Abiakari by Malami. And that's it on the nation newspaper this morning. Moving over to the uh, Vanga newspaper, uh, the following headlines, a big one actually. A nation's mood will decide our presidential candidate uh, with the following writers. Says PDP source adds North only ruled for two years during PDP's reign. Zoning a nutty issue will cross the river when we get to the bridge PDP leader and confirmation of Gumu Sasainik Commissioner coup against democracy PDP. 2023, Nigeria living on extra time, Sanusi, that's a quite a, a statement. Uh, the top of that front page, strike, our NEC will decide, uh, says Osode Keyasu president. Uh, adulteration responsible for Fios Kesti investigation. Uh, 2023, Nigeria is bleeding. PDP needs to take over power from APC. Wiki and Catholic bishops kick against frequent borings sit at home. More headlines from the Vanga newspaper. 2022 UTME uh, slash direct entry will decide or introduce self-service registration platform in Lagos and Abuja, says Jamb. And bandits kill 44 villagers in Niger State. Those are some stories coming on the front page of the Vanga newspaper. We'd like to now introduce our guest uh, who is a chartered mediator and conciliator, Chris Kende Owandu. Good morning to you. Good morning. Thanks for having me this morning. All right. Thanks for joining us. Let's start with uh, the first story on uh, the PDP. Uh, it's coming on the front page of the Vanguard Institute of the PDP saying um, that uh, they, um, the nation's mode will decide what the choice of their presidential candidate will be. In other words, as far as the zoning uh, principle is concerned, they have not yet made up their minds. What, what do you say to this? Well, PDP has been so consistent with that um, in the past few months, and uh, they've not come out to fully say where the, the pendulum will swing when it comes to its presidential candidates. Don't forget that they had this um, convention um, late last year where national officers of the party were elected, and um, the chairmanship of the party was on to the North Central, which is why uh, Senator Ayu is currently the uh, the national chairman of uh, PDP, and you also have other national officers spread across uh, various geopolitical zones in Nigeria. So, but it is not yet certain where uh, the presidential candidate is on the from fillers and from some of what, uh, what some of the leaders of the party have been saying. It seems that uh, the PDP is going to throw his uh, presidential uh, ticket uh, open to everyone. So, uh, but uh, that has not been determined until they come out with uh, whatever uh, is their mandate or what they decide, then it's for Nigerians to decide whether to go for the party or not. But there has been this clamor that um, uh, there is need for the PDP to zone its presidential uh, ticket to the south, uh, so the south, um, because for whatever reason. But there's also been that. Uh, from those opposing that, they've also said that, well, yes, we have a presidential candidate uh, presently uh, from the North, which is APC. But if you look at uh, um, the uh, PDP since 1999, you've had um, um, two presidential candidates from the South and only one, even the one that came from the North, um, um, lasted just uh, barely two years, and that was Yaragra. So that it is equity uh, because that um, that uh, presidential ticket is zoned to the um, to the north as the thing. But for me, it's neither here nor there. Um, I think that they should be able to put their hands together because APC is also having some crisis, and they allow they put their hands together and be able to decide where they want to zone their presidential ticket better. And it will be left for Nigerians whether to accept that candidate or not. 
uh, both parties are uh, having a similar, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, procedure or process, you know, playing it cool and uh, not putting too much out for now as to whether they're going to go the way of zoning or not. You know, some statements were made about even the APC uh, um, zoning its its presidency to the south and uh, Maimu Alaboni had to come out and say, no, we've not yet made a decision. Oh, I think it was Akpan Odoi who said so. Um, um, what, what, what do you think will be the factors? When, they, when the PDP talks about the mood of the nation, uh, what mood are they talking about? What will be the factors that will, because I mean, the mood could be anything. Uh, the Northerners in the party will always, North candidates of Northern extraction like Atiko, Abubakar and co, may want to still press for, for that, that opportunity. So, so what mood do you think they're talking about that may determine or will determine whether they go ahead with zoning the presidency to the south as per the north-south zoning uh, uh, arrangement? You know, when politicians talk, talk on both sides of their mouths, it's always very difficult for you to believe a politician when he talks. A politician can just tell you good morning, uh, Kofi, and you just when you're in the room, you just go out only to realize that it's 9 p.m. in the night. So you have so to check your time, of, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it's, no, it's very difficult to believe politicians. And in within politics, especially Nigerians, anything can change within 24 hours. And when we talk about the mood, I believe that they are, the mood they are talking about is mood of Nigerians. Uh, one. Um, to decide whether they actually need um, somebody from the south or from somebody from the north. Then also, uh, looking at the performance of the current government um, of APC, which in the past uh, seven years have been uh, led by somebody from the north, and Nigerians happy with the way a northerner or a president of um, a president, a president, a president of the APC, representing the APC, are able to um, galvanize Nigerians, be able to which Nigerians are able to harness most of the promises that they made in 2015. So those are the kind of uh, things. Then within the within the, uh, the political party also of uh, PDP, uh, there'll be intrigue, there'll be power show, there'll be power tussle here and there. What is coming to this? Even if they get it from, the, if they decide to decide for a, a PDP candidate from the north as presidential, what, what of the vice president? Where will it come from? Will it come from the south south? Will it come from the southwest? Will it come from the southeast? So those are the major debates. Um, that uh, we don't forget that they have serious uh, gladiators. Somebody, um, uh, um, the governor Tambua has already declared that he wants to run. Uh, the former Senate president, Anim, has declared he's from the southeast. And some other candidates have also showed their interest. And somebody, we are looking forward to uh, somebody like P2B and the rest. And we came out some few days to say that he has never agreed to be the vice president to anybody that is also well qualified. So those are the interests and those are the things that are talking about. Not always take these politicians for their talk. Anything can happen at any given point in time. All right, so Chris, uh, let's also look at the, the Guardian newspaper this morning. And uh, the banner caption there reads, uh, fuel scarcity, panic buying in Lagos. And uh, some other parts of the country or probably might also have witnessed uh, the panic buying up until this moment as we speak. I mean, there's a lot that's happening. The queues have actually returned. Uh, the big question a lot of persons are asking is what, what is really going on? Because a lot of people cannot really tell and understand why we have the queues back. Why do we have fuel scarcity? Could it be, you know, um, artificial scarcity that's been caused that is because you have a filling stations trying to hold the product? But we'd like to share your thoughts on that. Sincerely, I don't know for now, um, apart from the... Um uh, information that have been pushed up by the NNPC that uh, there's no need for panic buying where I have enough. I'm a member of the uh, NNPC media um, media editors uh, uh, forum and we are the, the sent information to senior uh, editors um, uh, within the industry informing us what happens in the industry and the statement, um, the last I, I, I read from them was that there's no need for panicking and the rest of the but um, it's neither here then that, that left room for rumors. If you have read, if you on your BB, I'm sure, or your WhatsApp, if you, if you ask ago, you've read all sorts of information coming from say, well, that was adulterated fuel, this and that, and that was why uh, the marketers have refused to buy and sell. Then, NATO, if you look also the front page of one of these papers, NATO is also uh, the National Association of Road Transport um, Workers, or what, um, whatever they call them. Owners. But yes, owners, exactly, um, say they are going on strike. But <laughs> what baffles me is that, despite the denial by NMC that there's no need for panic buying, that there's well everywhere, 
if you go to the NMPC headquarters, the central area in Abuja, there is a fuel station directly opposite that NMPC. And you will see the long queue of fuel that has been on for, for weeks now. So even if they are not saying, they are saying that there is enough fuel, from their window, I'm sure the GMD of NMPC, from his window where he sits at the top of NMPC, sees those queues around the central area in Abuja. And as I said, I said there is a fuel station. Kofi, if you know Abuja very well, if you, there is a, a fuel station directly opposite the NMPC. And you will see the long queue of fuel. So who is deceiving him? It's like the ostrich that just put his head right in the sand and leave the whole body exposed. Need people, so there are some people that have been saying, oh, that is a, a, a way of um, removing subsidy and the rest of them. But don't forget that the finance minister have come to say that subsidy have come to say that they are going to be a revised budget of the Central National Assembly and they are leaving the issue of subsidy till 2022 to the next government coming in in 2022. So they need to come out clean and tell like just what is happening. If you get to the the, the roads within the Gulf. If you are coming towards from the toll gate now, heading towards the third main line, you will see long queue of west and traffic everywhere. So this has been happening in Abuja for weeks now. It just started in Lagos a few days ago, and there doesn't seem to be any solution. And nobody is telling me what is happening. Um, uh, uh, my dear sister, ask me again. I don't know what is happening. And I don't. Know. <laughs> All right, uh, quite quite interesting. L let's stay with the um, with the. Uh, 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 Vanga newspaper and uh, look at uh, a statement that Sanusi Lamido, former mayor of Kano and former governor of Central Bank of Nigeria has made. Um, two papers quote him differently but I, I would like to go with or I would like us to go with the uh, headline on the front page of the Vanga newspaper where he says uh, 2023 Nigeria is living on extra time. Um, is Nigeria indeed living, living on extra time as Sanusi says? Well, um, Kofi, a, a lover of football, I remember what just happened at Afcon. <laughs> so, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. we are saying we played Egypt, and uh, at the end of that match, uh, they went to Nigeria. They went into extra time, and extra time in football it also means uh, it's anybody's game uh, because after extra time, they're going to penalties. And penalties is not the best. Thing that wins at times when it comes to penalty. So what Sanusi is saying is that we are practically living at extra time. Uh, the elasticity of the, the, the minds of Nigerians made up. Um, Nigerians have been pushed to the wall, and quite it's, it's just it might just something might just explode. That. And it's a fact. Um, we are coming from Sanusi. Um, I want to believe him. He's a he's a thorough economist. Uh, but I wouldn't forget also the role that Sanusi played in 2015. Or 2014, 2015, uh, bringing in this government, I knew how he vilified the former uh, president, Good Luck Jonathan, even when he was the set, uh, uh, governor of Central Bank. All that he said about um, uh, um, Good Luck Jonathan and the rest of them, which to a large extent was a form of certain people's opinion into accepting President Buhari in 2015. But several years down the line, he's coming again to say this. So that with that being too, we don't need the sanctions to tell us that we're having issues. We are having serious problems in Nigeria. We are having economic problems, we are having political problems, we are having insecurity question of insecurity, uh, debt. Um, just recently uh, we heard that China had used to give us more loans and the rest of them. So it is a misgreen uh, of sort. And um, it, it, it needs no suicide to tell us that uh, Nigeria is not getting it right. That I hope that this government will be able to do the deal because they have barely one year, and history will judge them by whatever they've done and how well they have been able to uh, deliver on the promises they made to Nigeria in 2015 and 2019. Okay, so let's also look at the uh, Guardian newspaper where Nigeria to spend 22 percent of uh, the 2022 budget on debt servicing. Uh, how does this make you feel as a Nigerian? I don't think you should be expect me to be happy, my sister, <laughs> as a Nigerian. I'm talking about you now. We're using about 79 percent of our foreign aid in debt service. I'm sure you are aware of that. So, if you're talking about 20, 20, 22 percent of a uh, budget, well, if correctly, I'm doing about 80 percent, 22 and 22 percent. What it means is that most of the things that we're supposed to do within the budget cannot be, especially the capital uh, projects, because that is the key to the economy. If you cannot be able to deliver on capital projects, then and the, the way our uh, our budget is built, you see that we we don't get a, we don't get more uh, capital budgets. You see that we just use it to pay salaries, a, a monument, 
um, take off four fees and the rest of them. And you have little left of capital project, which is where we are borrowing. We want to borrow to, uh, to construct trade. We are borrowing to construct second Niger Bridge. We are borrowing to construct, uh, construct road. We are borrowing practically everywhere. We have become uh, borrowers and borrowers. And it goes borrowing, goes a solo. And that is the, the situation. Which is why you can see what IMF came out. If, 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 if one of the headlines, you read one of the headlines. Where IMF was giving us certain conditions, things we need to do, and the rest of them. Because you have to rely on them. They will not tell you to go oh, remove subsidy, uh, devalue your Naira. Do this and do that. Is it to is it, it's to the detriment of Nigeria economy? And we continue to seek out. And I've always said is that until we be able to diversify our economy and we stop depending on just one so um, uh, 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 program, which is oil, we continue finding ourselves where we are. By now, we should be doing so much. The government told us we are. I don't know the number. They told us that uh, when it comes to production of rice, we went to Abuja and hit some uh, bags of rice on. Uh, uh, planks and the rest of them and telling Nigeria uh, about the whole world. Even though that uh, even countries that are producing rice more than us don't see them doing that. Haven't they dismantled the pyramids? They have dismantled it now. Are you not aware? So who are we deceiving? We cannot even feed ourselves. We are not telling people that oh, we are so much, we are so sufficient. Prices of rice have gone up. Now since that pyramid came up, it's the price of, price of rice about 35,000 naira now, more than what it was before they made the pyramids. So who is the same reason? So we need to do the need for and make sure that um, we do the right thing. I don't know whether we have an effective economic team. And that has always been my problem. We don't have a, an economy. We have Nigerians who can do the job, but I will give them the opportunity to it. We've done it in the past. Okonje Wala was there. Obviously, is there. Um, the, um, um, the current um, president of the uh, African Development Bank was there in, that, in those regimes. And we saw what they did. Even during the Obasanjo uh, regime, our debt were wrote off. We wrote off the debt we paid and we were clean. Let's see where we are now. If you look at our standard debt as it is present, we're even talking about repaying. Look, we are, the, what we are paying to repay the, 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 the interest is even far, far higher than even the debt itself. And that is the situation we find ourselves. It's quite unfortunate. All right, so thank you very much, Chris. Uh, um, well, let, let's look at the. the uh, the problem uh, of, of banditry in the northern part of Nigeria. Um, of course, uh, Governor Nasser Rufa at some time um, recently gave a, a statistic, uh, aggregated number of people who have been killed you know, in, in Kaduna State alone um, through uh, banditry or because of banditry. But today on the front page of the Vanga newspaper, I go back to that paper, it says bandits kill 44 villagers in Niger State. Um, even if it's one, it's a huge number. But it seems these days we're becoming... Our mind is because our brains, our minds, our eyes are we're becoming used to these stories, and you know it's easy to just read it and just move on to the next page. But this is really worrying. Forty-four villagers killed in Niger, and I'm sure yesterday there was another headline of people being killed by bandits. What do you I'm say? not getting used to it. I used to read. If you say you're getting used to it, it's, a, it's, a, it's presumption. We are used to it because. You just look at the number of people killed these days, it becomes numbers. We are counting on numbers now. We are not looking at it from the human angle that these are human beings uh, uh, whose lives uh, are being wasted by terrorists uh, for no good reasons. And um, the president, uh, a few weeks ago, a few days ago, said that he's going to hand over a more safe Nigeria um, to the next coming, uh, the, the coming administration. He has done seven years, going to eight years in the last uh, year. And if I have not been able to secure uh, Nigerians for seven years, then how, how come we're able to do that in, in just within one year? And the primary responsibility of every government that uh, shines in Chapter 2 of the 1999 Constitution I have amended is the safety of life and property of the citizenry. And any government that fails to do that is a failed, it's a failed government. So if you use that as an interest, then the current government is total failure when it comes to the issue of um, security uh, and insecurity. And the government came out few, um, from this back to say that they have a list of 96 uh, people um, uh, behind uh, funding terror. Before that, we've had about 400. Till now, nobody has been brought to book. Until we continue to go this route and making it seem that this is the norm rather than the exception, then this is what we're going to get. It's quite unfortunate. And let me tell you, Kofi, it is they just, the newspaper report about 40. I can tell you for every 40 that was reported, Another 40, double 40 or triple 40 must have been that we are not captured by the uh, by the media. And that is how we roll. And we don't seem to care and we don't seem to um, bother 
it is as I say in my place is that when you carry the corpse of someone else, it's like a log of wood. But if your relation or relative will be carried, then you should feel it. It is quite unfortunate that we are getting this right. And the report came out, um, I think, the last two weeks or there, that showed the number of Nigerians that have been killed in the past period. Over 10,000 or something. These are human beings. Go and kill a single American and see what the American government will do. Okay, so um, let's also share your thoughts. Uh, it dominated part of the papers this morning. The Guardian newspaper, the nation, the issue of Sondigbo. Well, according to the Attorney General of the Federation, the law would actually have to take its course. Now, I'm sure that you're also in the know that uh, Bene is going to detain Sondigbo for another six months. And the government in Nigeria is saying, when the law takes its course in Bene Republic, he would also be faced with his own charges here in Nigeria. I would like to share your thoughts on that. Well, it's a legal uh, issue, just like that of the um, camp. The court will take its uh, course. Um, but in fact, what, I, what remains for me, what is Sonic Bo being charged for? In uh, the Republic, uh, did, he con did he commit any crime in uh, the uh, Republic? Did he kill anybody in the Republic? Did he abduct anybody in the Republic? He was only using the uh, Benin Republic as a transit route. But anyway, he, 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 he forged a document. He, he, he forged a passport. passport. He actually yeah, forged a passport, I'm, which is I, a crime. I was saying, I was going to that. I was saying that. I was going there. I said they, they said that he forged a certain document and passport, which is trying to you to uh, to get to Germany. But if you look at it, I don't know the. I don't know much about the uh, uh, law. I know all that of Nigeria. So if he has committed that crime, and is, why is it going to take over one year now for them to be able to try him and want to sentence him to a center? And now if Nigeria has an extradition treaty with the um, Benin Republic, it behold on Nigeria to ask that it will be a back to Nigeria to face charges if there is any. Um, but um, I, I, what is going on now is political. When you are keeping somebody in jail for another six months without trial, that is in self infringed on his fundamental human rights as well. And I think that Nigeria should be fighting for that, irrespective of whatever. If, if the fact that Igbo is in Nigeria is the more reason why the Nigerian government should make sure that Igbo gets the best of, um, uh, uh, of judgment. If he's an American, Americans will make sure that their citizens, irrespective of whatever the crime he must have committed, get the best of um, uh, judgment. But what are we doing? We are sitting back, okay, let us wait for what the public is doing. After that, we are going to bring it back to you. That is not the way to go, which is why most Nigerians are not patriotic. Because anywhere we see Nigerians being killed, uh, a Nigerian girl was killed uh, recently uh, in one of the West African countries, I, I hope you remember, in one of the jails. She was killed and brought back to Nigeria. So many Nigerians have lost their lives in, in South Africa. Some have been killed in uh, other uh, parts of the world. And what has been the reaction of our government? For me, Irrespective of whatever the crime that he voted, I think he needs the best of legal representation so that he can get that. And if there is need to bring the people back to Nigeria to first try then all well and good. But it shouldn't be just thrown away, throwing the baby with the bad water and just keeping ourselves alive and waiting for Nigeria. But Christian Wendu, I mean, it's, it's a question that I'm hoping that I, someone would answer eventually. And I'm hoping that you give answers to it. The, um, the phrase or the postulation that says that you are innocent until being proven guilty by a court of competence jurisdiction. Is this not a universal concept? Is it limited to a particular crime? No, it is a universal concept. Even the UN Charter of Human Rights are able to take care of that and say that uh, you are as uh, innocent as anything until you are convicted. So they are only uh, they are alleged, to, they are accused. He is an accused person, allegedly. Uh, to have been involved in certain uh, infractions in, in the Republic. Uh, even if he has, as he's done in other parts of if Igbo is able to claim that his human rights is being violated in the country, he can seek for asylum in, in, in the Republic. He can. If he gets, if he was going to Germany, if he gets to Germany, he can seek asylum. And the government of Germany or whatever country will look at the merits of his um, uh, application and be able to grant him uh, Mr. Whether we like it or not, Ibuho, as far as it's concerned, they deserve the, the status of a refugee, whether you like it or not. His house was evaded by security agencies. Some of his family members of um, this thing we are killed. He was accused of uh, committing certain crimes and the rest of them. Police they said he was invited and the rest of them, they didn't show up and the rest of them. Yes, if he's accused of certain um, crime against the state, yes, he can stand trial. 
But the way it is as, as, as present as it were, I continue to say that the Nigerian government should be more involved. First and foremost, that this is a Nigeria, and all his necessary rights must be well protected in a foreign country. Then you can ask for extradition and get him tried here. And if the Benin government feels that he has committed an acre, they should be tried. The trial shouldn't last more than three months. Why is it last more than one year? Going to another six months and extending that? That in itself is a fundamental human rights issue, which should not be allowed to stand. Okay, um, uh, you know the the. The, the fundamental rights you're talking about, um, uh, some could argue it, 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 he's, he's awaiting trial, or rather he's, he's um, undergoing a trial. Even though he's been remanded in prison, and it's taken quite a long time in for him to, to, for this to be sorted out. But it, the trial is ongoing. Um, um, I mean, we have several persons in Nigeria who are in jail awaiting trial. They've not even begun their trial yet. They simply are waiting trial because they don't have probably a lawyer or here there's no vehicle to take them to court or someone has just forgotten about the case maybe from the DPP or something. Maybe the file has been sent to the director of public prosecution. is yet to be treated because of the, the volume of files that are being sent there on a daily basis. Um, sh should we be, be, be calling this a human rights case if the legal process is ongoing to determine whether he's guilty or not of the uh, charges against him? And his wife, namely forging uh, uh, Beninese's passport. Yes, the administration of criminal justice uh, Nigeria is a long road. Uh, it's not easy, uh, as you know. Um, so many things come to play. Uh, um, don't also forget that you have to uh, provide evidence uh, before somebody can be fully prosecuted. That is one. Uh, but the question you ask yourself: Why I continue to tell me human rights is? Why did um, uh, Sonny Buho leave Nigeria? Why was he going to uh, Germany? Why did he have to sneak out through the back door um, to find himself in Benin and from there trying to make his way to Germany? It's because he felt that his fundamental human right to be infringed upon and that um, there was an attempt on his life and he was to be killed. The same thing happened to Nnamdi Dekar. Don't forget that soldiers raided his house and they almost got him killed before he was able to sneak out and find himself um, in UK, wherever I find himself, until he was picked up in Kenya. So, um, talking from that angle, I see this as more human rights evaluation. So, so I'm, it, that is talking uh, this, about Benin now and criminality. Yeah, I'm yeah. Because, Benin, because, because the, the criminality element cannot be. I mean, are you saying that that if if you are um, a refugee or you're a prisoner, uh, you are an asylum seeker, or you're fleeing, you know, human rights abuse in your country, it gives you a right to potentially break the laws of another country? No, I didn't say that. That's what is called prisoners of conscience. Kofi, I'm sure you know that very well. So if for any reason, and I find my way in a situation that, for whatever reason, the DSS are going after me and they want to pick me up or want to kill me or uh, God forbid. <laughs> so, and, and I'll be able to see that my life is in danger. I have the right to be able to find my sneak out of Nigeria and find a safer place. And that in itself will become a, an issue. Why do you think that so many people seek asylum across uh, the state? Not this ones that go, this bed, bread and butter, uh, bread and butter kind of uh, asylum seekers, Nigerians are going to us part of the world and claiming to be uh, I'm talking of serious persecution and rest of it. Don't forget that some of his um, guys were killed. Don't forget that his wife was arrested also and kept uh, uh, with DSS for a long time. Don't forget there was a particular guy that say, they say was his herbalist that turns him into a uh, good, turns him into car. Uh, or turn into pussycat and the rest of them was arrested. So <laughs> all these things, we let the, the rest of the and the rest of them. So if what we did the human rights, that is my personal opinion. Anybody can have a contrary opinion. But my own thinking is that Nigerians, wherever they are, if we find ourselves, they find themselves outside this country and we see them being prosecuted in another country. And despite the fact that, yes, they violated it, we look at the necessary treaties between us and those countries and find a way of bringing there are some there are supposed to have treaties with that. If you are in prison, and like I think in Dubai and UK or some, if a Nigerian is sentenced, is, uh, is sent to prison in UK or thereabouts, we have a treaty that says that we can that person that can be repatriated to Nigeria and he will come to Nigeria and and, uh, and get but, himself but, in jail yeah. and uh, yeah. yeah. And I'm sure you are, well. are, are we not are we not expecting too much uh, of the federal government of Nigeria? I'm not trying to you know insinuate or I'm not trying to conjecture here, but. Um, based off of your answer and your 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 you know, the demand of the federal government to to do something about this man's situation, bring him back to Nigeria quickly. 
are we not uh, expecting too much, bearing in mind the fact that uh, an Igboho behind bars or in, uh, in custody, let's call it that, in, in, in Cotonou, um, will be one less issue for uh, the government, federal government, to worry about, bearing in mind his, his influence and uh, leadership of uh, uh, secessionist agitation in the southwestern part of Nigeria. Um, isn't, is, 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 is it, would, the, would the federal authorities be sleeping easily or have time for other things with him in behind bars? I found for the agitation, but let me ask you, how many people go who killed? Has he killed anyone? Has anybody directly linked to any death a, 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 to go who? The analysis did was when, when um, he says people have been killed at the Barapa, you know, your state. By Fulani, as men and the rest of them, we saw pictures of people that were killed. And they went there and said that, no, this cannot continue. Then he continues agitation. Agitation is another way of, of expressing yourself. It is a shine in the Constitution. You can demonstrate. You can agitate. In as much as you don't go out of your way to be able to do anything criminal. In, 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 a, in Spain, currently, in Barcelona, the people of Barcelona are still calling... Uh, and still want to leave Spain. Are you not aware of that? But if, if you were, if you were a, a Buhari or if you were Malami, would you be, be worried and be pressing, be saying, we need to get this guy out, he's a Nigerian, uh, we need to make sure that his rights are protected quickly? Will you be losing sleep over this? Or will you be saying, well, let's, uh, let's see what the uh, Beninese you know, legal procedure will come up with. We'll keep monitoring and watching it. You know, <laughs> what would you be doing if you were Buhari or Malami? I'm not worried. I'm not malam. I'm Christian. <laughs> but, <laughs> All right, we have to move on. Uh, uh, let, let's, let's also quickly check out this one. It still has to do with the issue of agitation. And then you have the IPOP reaffirming April as a deadline for the ban of cow meats in the Southeast. I mean, uh, a lot of people have actually queried the pattern. Like you have rightly mentioned, it's okay for people to protest and express their concern. And it's all right for people to say we want a different country. Ask for a referendum if you want to say. But, you know, with this move that you have the IP pushing for, saying we're going to ban, this is, we're still Nigerians now. I mean, you have all the parts of the country transacting or who are very, you know, prominent in this kind of business. And you're saying you're going to have some restrict. I don't know how that's going to happen, but let's hear your thoughts on it. Uh, I'm an Igbo man. <laughs> I'm from Igbo states. <laughs> if you ask me personally, I may have a different opinion uh, with iPod. I don't see any reason why cow meat should be banned uh, from the southeast. My problem is not cow. The cow is not my problem as an Igbo man. My problem is to be my people to be economically empowered. My problem is to my people to be politically empowered. My problem is to be able to find myself in the mainstream of Nigerian, uh, Nigerian states, where I have equal opportunity with somebody from Kanu, from Bonu, from Kasina, or any part of the country to rise to the highest position in the land if I'm found to be capable. That to me is the problem. So, um, uh, it, don't forget also that two days ago, a party cast belonging to an Igbo man was killed by a pop. Uh, are you not aware? So, what are we talking about? They didn't even know that the cow belongs to an Igbo man. And they killed the whole that the guy, the guy said he lost over 30 million. Man. So, for me, agitation comes in different form. I have always been that we can be able to have a more political approach to the issue of marginalization in the southeast. But resulting to violence and all sorts of um, practice to me does not resonate with me. I believe in the language. I believe in most of the things that someone like Nam De Kandu is agitating against, which is the marginalization of the South, South Easterners, of which I'm one of them. But we, because we like because of that, cripple the economic uh, life of the people of uh, South East by asking that on him every Monday that nobody comes out. I'll be the last person to support that. So, um, uh, issue of um, not allowing cars to come tomorrow. If the northerner said that anything coming to the should not cross into the north, what happens? That is not the way to go. I think that more better way and better approach to approach these issues than just right. going to interact with some of these things that uh, our people are doing. In, in, interesting, uh, Chris Kelly, wonder um, you you yeah, cited that example, reminded us of the incident in Enugu State where 
cows were, and, and a herdsman was killed, and, and this herdsman was said to be, have been a member of that community in Enugu for a while, and the cows belonged to a family and a chief in that community. Uh, a, a friend of mine, or someone I know rather, who is a herdsman from uh, Delta State, is an Urubu man, also says that a lot of cows we see in the southern part of Nigeria are owned by our brothers and sisters from this part of the country. But we'll keep uh, watching that space. Uh, Asu is still in the news. And uh, when Nigerians, I'm sure, would have expected that this, this issue regarding uh, uh, the, oh, the, the gray areas that are yet to be resolved um, that have led Asu to go on strike in the past will be resolved with the meetings, a plethora of meetings back and forth between the Ministry of Labor and Productivity and Asu. And, and we're hearing them talk of strike again. They recently declared Monday um, uh, what they call, I think, a sit at home, if I'm not mistaken. And today, on the front page of, of, of the Guardian, a Vanga newspaper, they are saying that their National Executive Council or committee uh, will decide on whether they're going to go on strike. That's what uh, Osodeke, the ASU president, is saying. Why are we still here? Why are we still at this point, uh, Chris Kendi Wan? Rufi, first and foremost, it's been a sweaty day for me. And see how I'm sweating like a Christmas goat. Uh, <laughs> is uh, but um, on a more serious note, um, is rather unfortunate. Uh, we have to go through this route. The government signed an agreement with ASU ten months ago, and today they've not been able to implement those agreements. And that has always been the issue. So if ASU decide to go on strike now, will you blame ASU? You cannot sign an agreement with an with a group of individuals. Are you learned that you don't you want them to go? When I'm taking up job with Plus TV, you had an agreement. You are given a, a letter uh, of employment. In that letter of employment, your salary was stated how much you be paid every month. If Plus TV tomorrow, when instead of paying you 100, uh, 100 naira, decide to pay you 40 naira, will you be happy? That's a related. You can see my sister smiling. That is a fact. That's a, the that's a situation. So you don't. <laughs> the, 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 I think the 100 naira is what God, God is a bit worried, but it's okay. I think we understand what you're saying. Hypothetical. I just did that <laughs> hypothetically. So, okay, let me say you are, you are they agreed to pay you 5 million monthly. I'm sure you'll be very happy with that. Uh, so, <laughs> we, we are so, still not changing, we're still not moved. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's certainly so, but, 5 million. Yeah. Yes, but on the most serious note, and they renege on that. And what do you expect them to do? And they've given reason why you need to do the will. And this is not the first time they're reneging on this agreement. Don't forget there was a situation where they also agreed with ASU. And they gave series and series of notices and nobody listened to them. And they went on staff for close to one year. We lost one full session. And that was the problem. And I've always said this. Let me put this. Until we're able to make sure that most of our leaders or political elites or political leaders have their children in Nigerian schools, universities. You make it compulsory. If you are going to become a minister, you are going to sign this that your children must attend um, uh, university in Nigeria. Not private universities, so public universities. If you are going to be a senator, but Chris, the same thing. If you are going to be a member of our society. Until they start doing that, we will continue to find ourselves where we are. And that is the truth. Uh, but, but, yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt uh, you, Mercy, but quickly, just a quick follow up question. Uh, uh, last week, the president hosted the Inter Religious Advisory Council. You had the Sultan of Sokoto who's the leader of uh, the northern, you know, uh, the, the Muslims in the country. The, the president of, of, of Khan, you know, leader of the Christian community, or at least those who are members of Khan. They went to see the president, and he hosted them at the Asarok Villa, at the presidential chambers. And he, he said that the, the, he, as president and the federal government, is committed to, to solving the Asu Ampas and created, raised a committee, another committee, to look into this. You know, so if the president has recently said, so why, why are we still having... You know, is it that that was just a hot air or a political statement or something made just to, for the moment by Mr. President? Yes, it is, because it's just like so many other promises that presidents made to us since 2015 that have not been fulfilled. So most often they are not. Uh, when the president speaks now, people hardly take him seriously. And that should be a president speaks president, what you call presidential. If once a, state, a statement comes from a president, that is the final. And the whole world should be able to hold him to that. But look at what is happening. Is the president not aware that Asu yesterday, um, today is uh, Tuesday, yes, yesterday Asu went on a lecture-free uh, day to sensitize members of the Asu on the need for them to start galvanizing efforts towards a mother of all um, strike. Is the president not aware? Has he called the Minister of Labor? Has he called the Minister of Education? Just merely telling the religious leaders is not enough for me. He knows what to do. The president should invite Minister of Education, should invite 
Minister of Labor, you should invite the Attorney General of, Office, um, of the Federation and also invite us to a round table and let this, the President have not for once done that. All the people that have been making efforts to solve this problem, uh, National Assembly, uh, Minister of Labor, uh, Minister of uh, Education, and that is why I don't even think that the, president, the Vice President has been involved. The President, the same way he received the religious leaders, should now call this um, these various groups together and give a directive. There okay, so, there. so Chris, uh, let me ask you this. Uh, you, you know, quickly as we go sit down now, I'm sure that this question will also be on the minds of a lot of Nigerians. Why do ASU always... What does the federal government say to us so that they call of the strike all the time? This is not the very first time. I see that here had experienced ASU strike for six months as a student in university. And so if the ASU, because it has become a practice that the federal government will enter into an agreement with ASU because ASU is trying to get the government to respect the law order, I mean the labor act and respect employees. And so if the federal government says we're going to, you, we get into an agreement and usually you expect that an agreement it should be respected because it's an agreement between both parties. Here you're talking about the government and then the government over time, this is not the first time, 10 months, seven months, what have you, why do ASU always, you know, have to call off the strike? What did the government say to them that they call off the strike? And then they know that the government will not respect it, they will not implement it, and then they call off the strike. So why do they keep going that same route? So if we want to embark on a strike, it might not sound very logical, but maybe we think about going on strike for two years. It probably would just make a difference because I don't understand that we, if, if ASU says they're going to go on strike tomorrow, it's not going to make any difference because they will call it off in five days. So what does the government really tell them that they call off the strike? Strike. And why do they keep going on that strike knowing that the government will not implement? And then we keep going in this circle. At the end of the day, you know that the grass will definitely suffer. We're talking about the students. In law, there's what we call valid contracts. It's a contract that is signed, sealed, and delivered. That is valid contract. And once that's what we call valid contract, then it is behold on everybody that's party to that contract to respect the terms of the contract. Then, back to your question, my sister, you and I will be the first people that will start castigating ASU if they remain on strike for over a year. What is it? What is the student at home uh, that become? Don't forget what happened during the SSP. Why the SSP um, this was so successful is that a lot of students were at home. It was the period of those strike. Most of them had not to do. All they now did was just move out and just convert um, at the toll, uh, toll gate, and we saw what happened. So. If, if you have an agreement with me, I want to believe the sincerity of what you've said. Because as a representative of the government, I believe you are representing the interests of not only the government, but also the people. So why wouldn't I believe you? If the government come out to say, don't forget that they use it as, as a thing of blackmail. They come out to tell Nigeria that we have agreed on this with ASU. Why is ASU not calling up the strike? And that is what happened. So ASU believes them. So if ASU was on strike for about 11 months. And at the end of it, our government said, oh, hands up, we've agreed. We've agreed to all that we've said. We are signing off on this, and the rest are sure that implementation will start off. And after that, they call up the strike. Three months, four months, five months, ASU came out to say, these people have not delivered on the, uh, um, uh, on the promises. What have we done? So I believe that it just goes beyond this. I also believe that at times, there should some, be some level of litigation. Just going on strike might not be able to solve the problem. I think that this should be put to test. Ashu should start going to, um, to court, even as a, a union. They should be able to take the straight to the high court, to the court of appeal, then to the Supreme Court. Let there be a judgment of the Supreme Court that okay. issues of this that right. have to do with contract with the federal government that is not in there. Then uh, let us have bet. The only option that they have is the strike, and that is the only thing that the federal government understands, the Nigerian government understands. But that has to work. We, we, we have to, we have to go. We have to go. But Chris, can you, you know, we, we, we said, I, I told you we were going to put it to us today, and indeed you did, uh, by citing some laws for us, and indeed also regional to ask you to go to court. Um, uh, I want to thank you very much for your time. Uh, uh, Chris Kane, the one who is a chartered mediator and consultator, has been our guest on Out the Press this morning, right here on Plus TV Africa. Merci. Uh, you went you uh, you were at home for six Messi was at home for six months, at least. You and know. I made a lot you of You know money, why she does way. some things she does. <laughs> <laughs> she exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do have a right, nice then. day. Mercy. Mm.
addressing? Well, so so it, it really worries me because I feel like that you know the issue of trust is a big question right here. Why do you keep trusting someone who keeps breaking the trust every time? You think you have a personal axe to grind with? We understand. No, I don't. I, I was never. I was never at home. Uh, no, I, I did. I did. But it was fantastic because I made a lot of money. I was quite productive at that time. Now but this is where we bring the conversation to an end. Talking about the paper review. When we return, we head straight to the very first major conversation right here. Please stay tuned. We'll be right back.